Now, uh, just to make this uh, really comfortable for me, you have to be like my students and just start surfing Facebook right now. <laughs> I'm very familiar. So, uh, so I'm gonna um, uh, I'm gonna pick up where uh, where where Mark le uh, left off, and you know he's gonna just jump in whenever. Sure. You know, and, you know. and, and Mark and I work on this uh, together. We actually are, have a paper that uh, you know hopefully you can pick up a copy of. Um, that we, we wrote with two others on um, uh, pragmatic, uh, a pragmatic plan for housing finance reform. So that's what I'll generally go through, is a little bit say, you know, here's the old system and the schematic is up there, and then talk about the, the new system. Um, now, I, I thought I'd just start by saying, I've actually been involved in housing finance reform efforts in some sense three times, counting now. So this is my third time. So the first time, I spent much of President Bush's first term at the White House um, at the Council of Economic Advisors, which of course is the economic think tank in the White House. And um, President Bush made a, this is a run at, at reform of Fannie and Freddie, of housing finance reform, which back then were incredibly politically powerful, right? And just uh, so the story I had in mind was an illustration of how politically powerful they were, uh, again at the time, um, was that uh, we were just learning, oh, oh we lost it. Yes. Uh, Oh, okay. okay. Sorry, it'll come back. We were learning about, um, you know, basically just trying to get up to speed on the issue. Uh, and Gre uh, Greg Mankiw was the, the chair at the time. And, um, uh, uh, it's all right, I'll get it. Um, good. Uh, was the chair at the time. And um, he was going to give a speech uh, to, a, uh, to a group of state banking regulators about the need for housing finance reform. And kind of everyone understood that that would be a big deal. Like, you know, the sort of the president's economic advisor weighing on, in on the issue was sort of the, the opening shot in a push for reform. Um, and so the Fed he has, has a really excellent, um, they have lots of excellent economists, but Wayne Passmore is sort of their housing finance, uh, you know, top guy and, you know, sort of a really excellent economist. And um, I remember Greg invited him for lunch at the White House mess. And so, look, Wayne, come on over. And I just want to talk. You know, it's a good way to, you know, people like to come to lunch at the White House and a good way to learn about an issue. Um, and so, you know, uh, I had lunch with him. And I remember Wayne saying, well, um, you know, happy to come. I just, how can I come in in a way that people don't see me? I don't want it to get back to Fanny that I'm having lunch at the White House. <laughs> so... <laughs> he was sort of wow. Yeah. So, yeah, and that, uh, so, you know, maybe Wayne is paranoid or whatever. I don't know. Um, okay. So that's the first time. The second time um, was in 2008 when I was at the Treasury Department uh, in, in um, August of uh, August, September 2008, when Fannie and Freddie were um, when the effort to, you know, basically put them into conservatorship uh, um, was being de uh, developed. You know, essentially the analysis and development. Of, um, of, uh, of that was taking place, and their independent independent regulator then took them into conservatorship in 2008, uh, September 2008, and then today, um, when there's efforts to uh, to reform the housing finance system, and that's what uh, that's what I'm going to focus on uh, mostly. So here you can see the old uh, the old system, and I think this summarizes what uh, what you know what, what Mark talked about, right? So banks and others. Um, you know, it could be the person on the street corner or whatever. The sort of new century was the, you know, the, one of the outfits in Orange County, California that made all these bad, well, you know, sort of risky subprime mortgages. But for Fannie and Freddie, right, the mortgages are conforming. Fannie and Freddie uh, buy the mortgages. But again, this is the old system, which is, uh, is still somewhat in place. Um, so Fannie and Freddie would buy, would buy the mortgages, make them into mortgage-backed securities. Fannie and Freddie would guarantee them but investors understood that if something went wrong, the government would, would step in and to make sure that these mortgage-backed securities, the you know, so-called agency mortgage-backed securities, were still good, which is what happened. Now, where did Fannie and Freddie get the money to buy the mortgages, right? I mean, so there's, there's you know, an arrow going back here to banks. They're, they're giving mortgages, and Fannie and Freddie are paying for the mortgages. Well, Fannie and Freddie would borrow from capital markets, right? So they go to um, uh, investors, and they sell off sell off debt, this agency debt. And of course, then they sell off the resulting mortgage-backed securities, so they're private sector investors, right? And so these investors were getting something, right? They were getting fixed income securities, right? So these would be mortgage-backed securities, right? So as Mark said, they don't have the credit risk, they still have the, the interest rate risk. And they also had refinancing risk, right? As, as people refinance the mortgages, the mortgages, the, the mortgage-backed securities change. Um, and then this would be debt, and so Fannie and Freddie would sell and would sell debt. And you might look at this and say, well, this is kind of strange, right? 
you're telling me this is debt, right? So Fannie and Freddie are selling bonds, and Fannie and Freddie are backed by the U.S. government, so isn't this just like U.S. government bonds, right? It should be the same thing, right, if they're backed by the U.S. government. So it turned out that this actually, that, that explains why Fannie and Freddie were so powerful, right? I mean, if I told you you could borrow money at the Treasury interest rate, well, you should borrow a lot and go buy every stock, all right, or whatever. You should, you know, since it's heads you win, tails the government loses, taxpayers lose, right? You should borrow as much as you want at the Treasury interest rate, and if things go wrong, well, taxpayers will take, you know, basically take the, the, the downside. Um, so this is kind of the illustration of the problem, one of the problems with the, with the model. And then as soon as you see this back arrow where it says portfolio, well, that, that in some sense operationalized the, um, you know, the, the implicit guarantee, whereas Fannie and Freddie, smart people, and they're not bad people, they just say, well, this is the system, where we can borrow at the treasury rate, or a little bit above the treasury rate, but not much above, and we can buy securities with a higher yield. Well, we should do that as much as we can, right? It's not a surprise they have $5 trillion balance sheets, because that's the, that's the incentive, right? If you can get this interest rate and pay this interest rate, well, you're making the difference. And so that's what these retained portfolios were. So Fannie and Freddie would buy mortgages, combine them into mortgage-backed securities, sell them off, and invest, private investors would buy some, but then Fannie and Freddie would buy some for themselves for the retained portfolio. Right. So th now I should say there, there are social benefits here, right? There's, you can see the benefits for Fannie and Freddie investors, you know, the people who own Fannie and Freddie, and the management of Fannie and Freddie. Um, you know, they're, they're making huge profits, and their bonuses are based on their profits. But some of this low interest rate, right? The, because because of the implicit guarantee, Fannie and Freddie's financing costs were relatively low, and some of the benefits of that did flow through to homeowners. So the estimates by people such as Wayne Passmore at the Fed suggest that this implicit guarantee was worth about 100 basis points, so one percentage point. And of that, about half of it went to homeowners in the form of lower mortgage interest rates, so 50 basis points, half a percentage point, and about half of it went to Fannie and Freddie's management and shareholders. Right? And, and of course, if you have 50 basis points of kind of free, um, uh, free money, VIG is the kind of Wall Street vigorous uh, uh, slang, um, you can, and, and five trillion, well that's a lot of money, and so it's not surprising that some of the Fannie and Freddie foundations were very powerful and political, you know, politically, socially, um, uh, things like that, right? So if any of you live up in Montgomery County, right, the, the purple line, right, so that's been delayed by some of Fannie, Fannie's foundation, right, was a big part of delaying that, right? So Fannie and Freddie got into lots of, lots of uh, things. Um, uh, so anyway, that's a side issue, but it's an interesting story. Anyway, so they're very, very powerful. Okay, so this is the old system. Um, okay, let's see. Yeah, let's see this. Oh, sorry. No. I know I can get this. Uh, good, okay. So here's the background, right? So they, they would do two things, right? So they're just summarizing. They'd bundle the mortgage into the mortgage-backed securities with the guarantee, and then they'd buy the mortgage-backed securities for their own uh, portfolio. The rest, I think, is just summarizing what, um, uh, what, Mark, uh, what Mark said, right? They were, were enormous, you know, huge part of the housing finance system. The losses they took ate up the very thin capital they had, and that's why they ended up in, in um, conservatorship in September of 2008. Um, if any of you haven't read it yet, I definitely, I recommend Hank Paulson's book. Um, and it starts with this. It starts with the takeover of Fannie and Freddie. So you can get some of the color. Um, and so, but they've been in government hands since September of 2008. And I think at the time, no one envisioned that they'd still be in government hands today. And no one envisioned that they'd be very profitable now, right? It seems that they're deeply insolvent, but now they're making about $20 billion a year in profits. Um, and so the situation is very, uh, yeah, it's very different. The government owns 79.9% of the shares, plus has nearly $190 billion of senior preferred shares uh, sitting on top of, um, of the, the people who owned Fannie and Freddie before the financial crisis, right? So this is kind of the situation. Yeah, I wonder if I can do like this. Yeah, good, okay, this is Mark's, I mean, Mark, Mark basically talked you through this. This is the, the losses uh, during the crisis, so I won't, um, won't go back. And again, Mark, Mark talked about, well, what happened during the crisis? Well, you can see, um, actually, I'll, I'll start before the crisis. This, in some sense, is when Mark talked about how private label securitization expanded, right? So this is the non-agency securitized uh, lending, Zoom, you know, uh, the market share of that grew considerably 
before the financial crisis, and this is the, the rise of subprime lending, right? So people, you know, and this, is, and this could be two different types, at least two different types of people. This could be people in some sense who probably never should have bought a home in the first place, but were able to because they get a very low interest rate for, uh, for two or three years on the idea that then they could refinance into, uh, into something longer. Um, in some sense, these are you know, sort of low, moderate income subprime lenders who maybe should have waited um, and gotten a fixed rate loan instead of an adjustable rate loan. Um, and then, of course, there's also people in here who probably could have afforded, you know, a house, you know, this house, but instead bought this house and took themselves outside of the performing um, uh, limits and outside of Fannie and Freddie, right? It's Fannie and Freddie losing market share. Then you can see with the crisis, as subprime lending shuts down, and as Mark said, these other uh, channels shut down, then the, um, the share of Ginny Mae, which is the FHA and others, uh, expanded uh, considerably, and then the private label securitization market has dried up, and since then it's even gone further. And then banks got very hesitant to um, to lend as well. What am I? Ginny Mae's FHA. Ginny Mae. Yeah. Uh, is FHA. Just, just, okay, yeah. very good. Yeah. I'm gonna actually every, every time before I I change, I'm gonna stop and look at you and just if you want okay, to. I'll go like this. Yeah, or whatever. <laughs> just, just, if there's anything you you know, yeah. Yeah. jump in, just jump in. Whatever. Okay. So um, okay. So uh, again, there are benefits of the GSEs, and as we think about housing finance reform, um, I think it's one thing to consider is that there are things that if the G if Fannie and Freddie didn't exist, we'd probably create something like, maybe not exactly like them, it wouldn't have the, the kind of heads they, they win, sh tails, share, uh, taxpayers lose, but there's things that they did that, um, that we'd want. So, uh, so bor borrowers do benefit from the lower interest rates, right? They provide liquidity in secondary markets, um, and through a thick and thin, right? So if there's another housing crisis with a structure like Fannie and Freddie, people can get mortgages. And I, I think that's a driving, that's a key driving factor behind efforts at housing finance reform, the idea that s some government involvement some as a backstop will ensure that Americans can get, um, can get mortgages. And sometimes this is the, I think of uh, um, Bergen County, where it says that's the challenge for, um, uh, um, for Mr. Yeah, it says Mr. Garrett um, would be, okay, imagine we go to the you know, fully private system you know, which again, I don't think his bill is, is as quite as private as, as it's reported. But if you did, and there's another housing crisis, and like Mark said, mortgage financing dries up, dries up, and people in Englewood can't get mortgages. Well, actually, I guess people in Englewood would get mortgages, but the ones in Teaneck wouldn't, right? Um, so, uh, uh, well, I'm enjoying this part. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the local color. I can I can translate that if necessary regionally. Um, so uh, you know, sometimes the people, right, people at the top would get, you know, would get mortgages from their banks because, right, the banks would say, well, look, you're my customer, I'm financing your small business, so I'm going to make you a mortgage loan on your three million dollar home because I've got, you know, seven other points of contact with you. Whereas someone who just walks in the door and says, look, I want a three hundred thousand dollar mortgage, might be, might be out of luck. Yeah, sorry, please. I'm just curious because you said that now they're, um, they're profitable and they're yeah. doing well. So does that if you purchase U.S. Treasuries, are you, is part of that profit going back to somebody who purchases U.S. Treasuries, or do you have to purchase Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to actually see some of that? Oh, okay, yeah, no, no, so the profit, it's, it's a really good question here, I'm going to see if I can go backwards, because um, it goes, it goes to who owns, um, one more here, who owns Fannie and Freddie, right, so the government now owns 79.9%, of the common uh, stock of the two companies, but then also um, the companies owe taxpayers of, of the U.S. Treasury about 190 billion dollars, um, and so to the extent that there are profits, the taxpayers are getting money. Now there is a complication. There's um, th in September of 2008 when the companies were taken in over by the government, um, taken into conservatorship by the government, they signed an agreement with the Treasury Department with certain financial conditions. And that agreement has been um, modified by the U.S. Treasury. And so the, and the modifications are, a, um, are an issue in, of legal dispute, right? So there's, there's lawsuits about uh, those modifications. Um, right now, all the profits go to the U.S. Treasury. And so some of the lawsuits are about should that continue to be the case and what happens going forward. But had they paid back everything that they took in? They from haven't, the they're virtually, they haven't quite yet, but- um, They're close. They're close. So the 187, 187 or whatever billion dollars that they've received from the Treasury, 
the amount they've um, transmitted back to the Treasury is just below this. But they haven't, under the legal agreement between them and uh, the Treasury, there's no mechanism for them to pay off their what they owe to the Treasury. So, Phil, wasn't so. it designed originally to, it was designed, wasn't there some intent that they would never be able to get out of this? It, you know, it wasn't necessarily that they'd never be able to get out of it. It was just never envisioned a situation where they would get out of it, right? It was never envisioned a situation where, you know, five years later, they'd s still be in this situation and be profitable. Right, so that's you can say it's a failure of imagination to see, uh, uh, so the, in, in many dimensions, right? So the, the partisan of me says that you know the Geithner Treasury would be so, you know, sort of so um, lax in, in pushing forward with reform. I mean, obviously, President Geithner's <laughs> or, or <laughs> Treasury Secretary Geithner was not at the top of the government org chart, so um, you know, it's not entirely his fault. Uh, but you know, they, 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 we'd still be in this situation and. They'd be profitable, yeah. So I, I think um, uh, that's partly what's driving the efforts for reform. So we had the de the people who bought their debt, the mm -hmm. corporate debt, and those people were they spared? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. okay so, so um, yeah. So, so there's that's three things. The so, so there's mm -hmm. people who bought the mortgage debt that they created, mm -hmm. the aid, the MBS. There's people who, and those people were spared. Mm -hmm. That's the taxpayers the stepped up to the plate and said, you were made whole to all the investors and bondholders who bought the agency, that mortgage-backed securities. And then there were the people who bought the corporate debt, the stuff that Fannie and Freddie, the corporations, borrowed mm -hmm. to keep their businesses running. Did those people, were they made whole? They were made whole. They well. were made whole also by the federal government, by the taxpayers. And then there was a third group of people, which were the shareholders, people who bought stock in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, highly successful stock, I think it was trading above $80 a share, um, plummeted down to like two cents at one point, it went, it went um, to the pink sheets, it's not traded on the markets anymore. But so now those people are still holding those two cent shares of stock. They've been wiped out, Ralph Nader's one of them, right? You and I probably have some money there somewhere through our 401ks. Those people, now there's people out there buying up those two cent penny stocks and they're saying, hey, wait, what about us? The bondholders were all made whole. What about the poor shareholders? So that's, I think, okay. what you're talking about. Yeah, no, that's right. So with this, this new deal with the Treasury, that's what's being litigated. Yeah, so this is the situation with the Treasury. The Treasury yeah. has said to, you know, Ralph Nader, and, you know, Ralph Nader's basically in it because um, many minority owned banks own these, uh, own these shares. Um, is that, I mean, it's not, it's not for him personally, it's for his, 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 his you know. People politics, who, politics. yeah, people who he, he, you know, cares about. Um, uh, the federal, essentially, the Treasury has said to Ralph Nader and his, you know, his people and then other investors, lots of hedge funds and the like, all right, you still own your, your the twenty point one percent, but we get all the profits. So it's a little bit like my saying, well, Stacy, you own your car, but I'm going to drive it, and you're never going to drive it again. So do you still own it? Right? Well, you know, anyway. So that that's kind of what the legal law. Uh, Dispute about. Okay, so so Fannie and Freddie again. I'll go back to this. They did some things, right? So the federal government is a way to subsidize interest rates to some extent. Um, now, of course, you can see well, taxpayers weren't compensated, right? The the guarantee was implicit, and when things went wrong, taxpayers got uh, you know 190 billion of, uh, of cash they had to pay out, um, and they didn't get paid for for, uh, for this in advance. So that's number one. Um, number two, though, once they were taken over, the GCs worked, right? They Mortgages were available throughout the financial crisis, even as other parts of credit market locked up. Right, so it's hard to get a, a loan on. If you want to buy a tractor, that Fannie and Freddie didn't lend money for tractors, it was pretty tough to get a tractor loan, um, but you could get a, a, a mortgage loan. Right. Then uh, number three, of course, as uh, as uh, Lorraine and Mark said before, right, they um, this was a way the Fed could influence monetary policy. Right, they by buying, as Mark said, buying the MBS is a way for the Fed to to um, to stimulate the economy. Uh, and then there's some affordable housing subsidies. There are the uh, affordable housing goals that Fannie and Freddie were required to um, to buy mortgages in um, uh, that serving moderate and low-income uh, families. And so in some ways that provided some subsidy for um, for affordable housing. A lot of people looked at this and said, well, it, it's not well targeted, right? It's probably better ways. And so the question is, do you need to give a subsidy? Do you need to help someone buying an $800,000 home in order to help someone buying a $200,000 home? You know, so in some ways you can imagine not, you know, n not doing the former and only doing the latter. So that's that's the sense in which 
they were not well targeted. Um, and this is part of the, the debate for, uh, for reform. But these are the benefits, and um, in some sense, right, I, I think any reform going forward would still want to make sure that these benefits uh, remain. Uh, one measure of the value of the government support before the crisis was the difference between a mortgage that didn't qualify for Fannie and Freddie and one that did. So it's just interest rates on the two different ty types of mortgages, right? So mortgages that are too big for Fannie and Freddie and mortgages that Fannie and Freddie brought, uh, bought. And this is about 100 basis points. It kind of varies from 50 to 100. Um, and this is actually, and this is compressed. They, this cross actually, so if you went forward, there are some, there, uh, these have actually crossed. And you say, well, that, that's weird. Why would a mortgage that's not guaranteed have a lower interest rate than one that is? Well, it turns out that this market is very small. That's what Mark, what Mark said. And so you might say, well, Wells Fargo, I'll just again use a name. Why would Wells Fargo give a lower interest rate on a mortgage it keeps than one that it sells off and doesn't have to worry about? And it turns out that Wells Fargo is making these mortgages to, you know, to the best customers, right? So the sense which is not quite a loss leader, but it's part of a, you know, part of a package. Um, so those are just come down, right? But this, again, this is just an indication of this, uh, of the, 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 the federal subsidy um, was the, the difference in the uh, mortgage rates, right? And so this is the benefit. This but the they've benefit. also, so um, the one other thing that's happened is that the um, conforming mortgages have gotten more expensive, right? Because now we've realized that shoot, you know, we weren't actually charging enough to take on this risk, we the taxpayer, mm -hmm. right? And so what has happened now is Fannie and Freddie, under their regulator, their overseer, um, has started charging more to guarantee these loans. Mm -hmm. And that translates to slightly higher interest rate um, at the end of the day. So yeah. that's another reason that's ticking up a little bit is we're actually starting to like, yeah, let's charge people for taking on this risk. Okay, no, no, that's perfect. And in terms of that's, so as I shift into talking about reform, that's, I, I think, the sort of top thing to keep in mind is that re what will reform solve? Will reform will, one of the problems reform will solve is that taxpayers weren't protected in the old system, right? They're giving the insurance against bad things happening in housing. Well, they're essentially giving, away that, giving that away for free since it was implicit, it wasn't priced. Um, and then number two, private investors didn't have enough of their own money on the line. There wasn't enough capital in the system. And so as we fix those two problems, well, that will translate, as Lorraine said, into higher mortgage interest rates. So, yeah. does, does that get solved um, in FHA through the insurance premiums? In part, yes. So FHA. FHA actually is not profitable. It had to draw. Has had to draw, yeah. So FHA, FHA is, it's interesting because FHA is profitable today, but what that um, actuarial evaluation is saying is what's the flow of future profits against the projected losses on their existing public oh, business. So they had to draw for reserves? To reserves, okay. yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, so it's interesting, actually, the um, you know, FHA just put out this press release a few days ago, which if you sort of re read their press release, they're making it sound like, a, you know, we're, we're in great shape. But it's actually before they were, like, really in terrible shape, and now they're still in bad shape. They're just not quite in as terrible shape, mm -hmm. but they're still insolvent by their, you know, by their measure. So it's kind of a triumph of um, press release, if you, uh, if you read it. So it's kind of like, well, but the Titanic still sank. So it's only saying the iceberg is smaller. But go back to, the, I mean, don't go back to, but you yeah. saw that orange part on this slide that said Ginny May, and that's, that is the Fannie and Freddie for FHA. It's the entity that bundles all the loans into bonds. And you saw how big the orange piece got, like at the end of the mm -hmm. slide, so today, Ginny is now, I believe, bigger than Freddie. Okay, so that means FHA basically is bigger than Freddie Mac, doing more loans, you know, securitizing. Ginny's just securitizing more loans, so FHA has gotten much, much bigger um, to okay. fill this yeah. void. And I, I actually just, and yeah. I, just to add, is that yeah. so? Just, I, I think it's totally legitimate yeah. as a matter of public policy to say yes, we know FHA took on more risk and has suffered financial losses. But they played an important public role, and this is what they're there for. And you know, this is right. That we want this is what we want the government to do when we take risks. And I think it's entirely a legitimate point to make. It's just not the point that the administration's made, right? So um, just, uh, I could argue better for them. Um, okay, let's see. So uh, concerns, right? I think we've we've talked about this, right? The private, you know, the, the sort of heads investors lose, tails or win, tails the government loses. The systemic risk. Uh, is an interesting issue, and you might say, well, why did the government bail? Why did the government bail out um, 
uh, Fannie and Freddie or so stabilized them in September 2008 when FHA could have just expanded. Well, it turns out the debt um, and mortgage-backed securities of um, Fannie and Freddie were widely held within the U.S. banking system, right? But foreigners also, but within the U.S. banking system, um, that they were essentially treated as if they were treasury securities. And the, I, the, the problem is that had Fannie and Freddie gone bust, uh, U.S. banks would have suffered losses, suffered massive losses, and it would have meant the entire banking system would have had to be recapitalized. Right? So there's a sense in which the U.S. government was stabilizing Fannie and Freddie, both so that homeowners could get mortgages, but also to stabilize the U.S. financial system. And that's the st systemic risk, is that these firms were seen as so safe that, um, that their obligations became embedded in our financial system. So that's number, one, number two. Uh, number two, number three. We talked about the subsidies. Um, uh, you know, the, so the only the, this is number three is only part of the subsidies got through to homeowners, right? The shareholders management skimmed off uh, half of it, right? It wasn't done in a transparent way. So this Fannie and Freddie, by dominating the industry, made it so that others really couldn't play as big a role, and maybe that would reduce um, uh, innovation in the system. Um, today, one of the concerns is that the you know, with 20 billion in profits, the head of the the firms, who was now really the head of the of their regulator, could use them for spending. All right. So if I, you know, order if I'm the head of the FHFA, the regulator, and I or I order them to provide low interest mortgages to all journalists, well, that's really a spending program for the benefit of journalists. Right. So can I go back to something you both said yeah, on, on that point? If there's 20 billion in profits for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, right, mm -hmm. a year. And you have shareholders that basically are holding those two cent per sheet shares. Why can't they use the 20 billion and issue a dividend? Because uh, of that treasury deal, remember? The treasury deal, yeah. That treasury so all deal, the profits have to go to the treasury. The treasury locked them up because, I mean, for Why whatever they, reason, but the treasury they can't amend Somebody's it. Somebody's. They can. Yeah, they can. I mean, so yeah. the treasury. Why would so they the treasury. Want to the treasury would say, "Well, look, we're, right. we like this deal," and I, so obviously the shareholders have gone to the courts and said, "Hey, this is." Got it. And, and so there's a whole. And don't it. forget, they still haven't paid us back totally. Yeah, they haven't. Exactly. So let's let. Why would the shareholders get anything when we haven't been paid? We, the taxpayers. The same thing happened to Barclays. The GM stock pool never got paid. Their stocks went to zero. The old, the old ones. Yeah, the old yes, the old ones. In some sense, the situation I look at is AIG, right? Because AIG um, was very was similar to um, Fannie and Freddie, uh, but the pre-takeover shareholders actually got not 100 percent, but they actually got some back, and that's because it turned out that AIG was so profitable that I mean, a, the federal government took essentially took over AIG, took 79.9 percent of AIG, um, and then had senior preferred shares, you know, uh, on top. But AIG sold some of itself off and then just operated its, its uh, subsidiaries and made so much money that they were able to pay the federal government off and then have money left over for their, uh, their shareholders. And this is what the Treasury has done is say, we, we're not letting that same deal happen. So, and again, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not making a judgment on the wisdom of this, um, but it's, you know, it's under uh, court dispute. Okay. Um, okay, so what, what are the principles, right? So make sure people get mortgages, right? So that's uh, number one. Avoid the, the kind of problems of the past. Protect taxpayers, right? If taxpayers are going to take on risk, we'll first have private capital on the line and then let, make sure that taxpayers are compensated for taking on the risks. Oh, we want to help homeowners, right? So if there, there, there could be a role in the new system for support for affordable housing. Um, uh, right now, the government dominates the uh, mortgage system, as Mark said, so probably having private incentives will lead to innovation. Now, of course, innovation got a bad name during the financial crisis, right? Des deservedly so. So I always kind of pause when I say beneficial innovation. <laughs> so, but of course, you know, who knows, right? What innovation is good, what innovation is bad. Um, have a more transparent system. And then I'd say separate out the public and private roles. That'd be my, my uh, principles. So I'll stop pausing for a second in case uh, Mark and Maria, you know. I, I mean, I think it's, what I think is interesting as a reporter about this is Really, at this level, everyone is on the same yeah, page. Yeah. Like everyone yeah. is on the same page. Garrett, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, you know, Mark Warner. Like it's kind, of, you know, Barney Frank. All right, like yeah. So the big, the big philosophy is we like okay, that's been settled. You know, I I tell you, what's fascinating to me is that is for a long time people talk about principles. So like the Treasury Department in 2011 put out a paper which basically their principles, and there's a sense in which I think. 
saying here are my principles is kind of like saying I'm not saying anything. You know, sort of it's like principles is a synonym for BS, kind of, or for, you know, just it's time to go beyond principles. Yeah, and when Treasury did put out their principles, which was a big dog and pony show, and everyone was there, even the Treasury, you know, behind the scenes was like winking and nodding. They're like, yeah, we know this is this is kind of a joke because everybody has the same principles. So where's the road? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to that. The later. Taxpayers. I'm sorry, what? If it's owned by the taxpayers at yeah. this point, um, are the are the management of these institutions still making the Franklin Ladies kind of money? Has that changed? Mm, not as much, but um, they're making CEO type money. Franklin yeah. Money. Is that warranted? I mean, so if, if, if it's a government, if the, why aren't they GS something? No, no, that's right. That's, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, no, absolutely. And in some sense, that's the, you know, in part, the director, the acting director of the FHFA, um, right, who's soon going to, you know, no longer be the director, has said, has said busy two things. Right, I, I want the, I, you know, this is a tough job. You know, doing this is an important job. These are, you know, $5 trillion companies. We want, people, you know, who have the, the cap capability to do that, is implicitly saying, look, we've got to pay more than a GS-13 or GS-14 to, um, to get the right people. Um, the second thing he said is, I'm, I'm, this is temporary, right? It's up to the Congress to decide the future of the GSEs. If they make the GSEs part of the government, well, then, of course, it's going to be GS the GS scale. But until then, I'm not, you know, I'm just sort of conserving. I'm not, I'm not making changes. But that's certainly a point of contention that, um, yeah, absolutely, the management... Uh, yeah. Does that become an issue in the reform? Or absolutely, that? absolutely, absolutely. And the and yeah. it's the stat the executives um, they were all heavily invest, uh, invested in the stock, um, mm. at the ones at the time, and that was wiped out. Yeah, so they did take big losses. Absolutely. Okay. Um, all right, very good. So so uh, and I think what Lorraine said about everyone has the same principles. It's just a matter of well, what um uh, what to get there. So again, agreement. On um, on lost things, private capital, smaller government share. You know, get rid of the kind of heads shareholders win, tails uh, uh, taxpayers lose. Uh, competition, and then uh, so that's what's, what's striking to me is that there's so much um, agreement uh, on this. Um, should should there be these retained investment portfolios? Then no, right? The system where GSE, the you know Fannie and Freddie or anyone can borrow very low and invest high, you know, with taxpayers taking the, the downside. No, I think everyone agrees. No, should Fannie and Freddie be the the lender of last resort, right? It, it used to be that that um, Fannie and Freddie would say, well, the reason we buy our own mortgages is because someone has to, right? If times are tough, we're the lender, we're the the last guy, right? So we're there to support the market, you know, because otherwise no one's going to get a mortgage. And now the Fed can do this, right? We've all seen over the last uh, five years that the Fed can do this, and so this is in such as a, a macro policy issue, and this would be a role for the government. So this is part of separating out. Um, affordable housing, where in the old system, Fannie and Freddie would have this affordable housing mission under the so-called affordable housing goals. I think there's consensus now that this, again, should be separated, um, that the government should do affordable housing activities. Um, now, it could be, or you know, explicitly spend your tax. You know, it could be that, that Fannie and Freddie pay for it, though. Right? You can imagine a tax on right, anyone who gets a mortgage that benefits from the, you know, the, the activities of Fannie and Freddie as supported by the government might pay a tax, which then goes to, um, to support people um, uh, you know, for affordable housing activities. And, the, and the, the, um, the Senate bill has this feature. Right? Now, I should say, w one of the other issues that's, um, that's in the news now is that the, the July 2008 legislation that um, allowed Fannie to be, and Freddie to be taken into conservatorship set up these housing funds, right there, um, these two separate housing funds, which never have been funded, right? They're taken into conservative. The firms were supposed to pay hundreds of millions of dollars for these affordable housing funds. Um, they're taken into conservatorship. They had losses. And the regulators said, well, they're not going to pay into these affordable housing funds. Of course, now they're making $20 billion a year. So there's a sort of whole housing, affordable housing community that says, well, look, we're owed, right? We're owed five years, hundreds of millions of dollars, plus going forward. Right, so start writing checks, and I think that's one of the pressures that um, that Mel Watt, right, who's recently been, been confirmed as the director of the, you know, the, the regulator, will face is to write the checks, which of course goes back to what I had the point before, that, you know, these firms can be used for spending, 
right? So, um, okay, very good. Uh, and, and again, I can talk more about any of these things, but um, I'm going quickly just about uh, as time. Um, right, so, so this is the, the heart of the debate over housing finance reform is over the role of the government. And so this is a, so this is housing finance reform is a microcosm of the larger debate in our society about what's the appropriate, appropriate role of the government. And I, I think Mark, Mark and I you know, talked about this and worked on this. I think we both have come to the um, realization or belief that the government would intervene in housing. Right? The housing market locks up. The government would intervene for social reasons to make sure Americans get mortgages, for the financial reasons he outlined at the beginning. Right? If housing is $10 trillion, uh, you know, as big as the corporate bond market. I mean, so as soon as you ask yourself, if no American corporation could borrow money, I think the government would do something about that, right? I mean, whatever, whatever they do, they do something. It's the same thing. If $10 trillion part of the market locks up, I think any government would uh, would, would intervene. Didn't, didn't Treasury actually do that, provide a vehicle for corporate borrowing? Yes. TAN? TAN? TALF. 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 So yes. you've heard of TARP? TALF? TALF. There's a whole alphabet. Like, a whole alphabet <laughs> soup. Like sort of um, that yes. small version. Yes, exactly. So, um, so that's in some sense that... You know, and once you agree to that, once you sort of say, well, yeah, you're probably right, if things go really bad, the government's going to intervene, well, then it, it kind of makes sense to, to structure the intervention, make sure taxpayers are paid in advance. Um, uh, and, and this is the, the debate is, could, you know, if you said, no, 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 I don't want to intervene, could any government credibly commit not to intervening if things got really bad? I just think it'd be hard to, to make that commitment. And so, you know, that, I think that's just the, the nature, the rea reality of our political system. So that's what leads me to say, to backstop the market. So, anyway, I'm just, I'm mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. very good. Um, and, and of course, the government has a unique ability to, to take on these systemic, uh, systemic risks. And then the question comes down to design, okay? Um, let's see. All right, so let's just talk about the future design, and I'll, uh, I'll, be, I'll be quick. What are we ending here? 11, 1130? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 11.30. Okay, very yeah. And I think it's worth probably maybe focusing on your proposal. The oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we will. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, very good. So this is, the, uh, this is my diagram of the 20, 2011 Treasury paper had three options. And what was fascinating to me is I, I see the options as really linear in the sense that they're all kind of on the same line. It's just a matter of how far reform goes. So let me explain what I mean by that. So here's today where there's no... No private capital, and the government stands behind basically all conforming loans, right? So all but the kind of, you know, sort of San Francisco, big house, New York, Westchester, Montgomery County, Fairfax, you know, sort of all that. Um, uh, okay, so um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to think of a Minnesota suburb. <laughs> here, so, uh, Minnetonka. Minnetonka, St. Louis, no, St. Louis, Park. St. Louis Park, exactly, very good. Um, Good effort, thank you. I just couldn't come up with it. So, um, uh, I've been there. Okay, so, um, uh, uh, so that's today, right? Um, so then, then think about if the government starts charging more for its insurance. It says, okay, look, we're going to cover these mortgages. Things go bad, we're there for it. But A, we're going to charge you for it, right? The private sector has to pay for it. And then B, private investors have to, have to take some losses first, right? So that's, so that, that's the, the Treasury's third option is so that now the, the government, their guarantee is secondary, right? So A, there's a, a, a so-called G fee, people are paying, this is the guarantee fee, they're paying for the insurance, and also there's private capital, right? That if things go bad, private investors take losses, and then the government guarantee kicks in, okay? But the government is still covering, you know, basically 100% of mortgages. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's treasury option three. Now, imagine going further, and imagine increasing the guarantee fee, Right, saying, okay, if you want the insurance on this mortgage, you have to pay more for it. And then B, if you want the insurance on the mortgage, you've got to have really a lot of private capital first, right? Private investors have to take pretty substantial losses before the government kicks in. Well, as you do that, as you go far enough, right, so just going on this line, as you go far enough, there's going to be some mortgages that voluntarily choose not to get the government guarantee. Right, to get the government guarantee, you've got to pay this big insurance premium, and you've got to get lots of private capital. So you could imagine so Wells Fargo saying, well, we're, just, we're not going to bother selling this loan off to the government, because right, we're, we're Wells Fargo, right? we've got a big balance sheet, people trust us, and there'll be some, you know, some point when the government share will be less than 100%, and you just keep going. right? So again, the, there's these two levers, the amount of private capital, the insurance fee, you 
crank those levers enough, you turn the, the handles enough, and the government share will start shrinking. Right? So eventually, imagine you do that enough, so the government only insures 10% of loans. Right? And that's c treasury number two. Now, if things go bad, the government can change those dials. The government can say, well, we're going to lower the insurance premium because we know that no one, you know, there isn't private capital, and we're going to say that private investors don't need, need to take the first loss. So the government, in some sense, under treasury number two, the government can go, go back from here to here if things go bad. In some sense, they, you know, someone's like the football metaphor, someone throws the red flag and the system changes, and you go back to here. But in normal times, the government share, by changing these two levers, the government share is, is only 10%. So that's treasury option, option two. Now imagine going further, raising the insurance premium, just jacking it up. Well, you, we're here. We're here for you. You want a government insurance? Oh, I'm happy to provide it. But the insurance fee is so astronomical that you'd never take it. Right? Well, that's option one. Right? So there's really the same, the same system. And in some sense, the, the mechanisms for reform, so there's three. There's one I haven't mentioned. Right, so one is the how much you pay for the government insurance. Two is how much private capital is required to take losses before the government insurance. And then the third one is, well, which mortgages qualify? Right, so you imagine dialing down the, um, the, uh, you know, the conforming loan limit, right, saying, well, look, an $800,000 mortgage, I'm not going to insure that. I'm just, you know, we're going to insure a $400,000 mortgage or three hundred. dollars Or you could say in New York, Six hundred in Minnesota, four hundred. You know, you can imagine any, any system, but that's another a third uh, lever with which to reduce the, the government footprint, right? The government exposure, and so eventually, if you do those those three levers enough, you can get down to a fully private system, right? So there's a sense in which the Treasury presented three options, which are kind of variants. They're basically well, points in a spectrum uh, between it. And again, I'm I'm trying to say. The reform, there's a lot more agreement on reform. So the sense in which they're kind of, you know, sort of Mr. Garrett versus Mr. Menendez is, you know, I think Mr. Menendez would probably be somewhere, you know, I don't know, around here, and Mr. Garrett would be somewhere around here, but they differ by parameters, right? Which I, I'm not sure they recognize, but I think that's a, a one way of that. Would you, as you raise the guarantee fee, mm -hmm. then private sector competition can come in and say, hey, we could maybe afford to do this at a lower guarantee fee. Yeah, that's exactly. the way you kind exactly. of suck uh -huh. in. I mean, you sector. can imagine like Warren Buffett saying, hey, I'm good. You know, I'll, yeah. the government's going to charge you 75 basis points for the insurance. I'll give it to you for 30. And, you know, you, got, you just got to trust my balance sheet. But I think, you know, yeah. Yeah. that's the mechanism for mm -hmm. this private sector. How does the private yeah. sector take some of the loss work? Ah, uh, okay, no, very good. So this is something that um, there's, there's different ways to do it. It's actually happening today. So Fannie and Freddie today are selling <coughs> selling bonds. Bless you. Are selling bonds uh, with the structure of the this is their um, their so-called credit link notes. So the bond. So um, uh, it says this, I borrow money from you, right? So you you I'm, I'm Fannie. You're a private investor. You give me you give me a hundred dollars, and I pay you an interest rate. You know, say it's a 10% interest rate, so pretty good interest rate. But there's a pool of 1,000 mortgages that we've agreed on. And if those 1,000 mortgages go bad, well, I pay you less. Right? So as they start going bad, you don't get as much back as, as you thought. And if they all go bad, well, you just you lose all your money. So there's a sense in which you are now taking the risk ahead of the government. Because right? if those mortgages go bad, you start taking losses before I, the government, have to start uh, taking the losses. And those are, these are the so-called stacker notes, is what they're called. But essentially, they're, they're ways for the private sector to take the, the credit risk on housing in front of the government. And it's not on all. You know, these things are pretty small. And, um, uh, but it's this a way. This is new. Yeah, this, is, new. this is it's new. new. Mm -hmm. It just happened like a couple, since the collapse, a couple years ago. And, and it's exactly what Phil said. It's like, um, well, Fannie and Freddie have, um, why should why should the taxpayer be taking all the risk on these? They're they're already I call it I call it incremental reform. Yep. Like Ed DeMarco, the guy who's been managing these companies for the last X years, has basically been moving them in the direction of this treasury sort of hierarchy in a lot of small ways that like we don't necessarily see. Yeah. Sort of. That's a pretty big pool of loans already. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's very small. Very they're just they're picks. just sort of dipping their toe mm -hmm. into yeah. some of these ideas. In this sense, which is like setting up a system. Is it, yeah. is it yeah. analogous to the tranches? That mm -hmm. the it's somewhat system? analogous. Exactly. So the, the details matter or differ, but the idea is the same. That you know, there's sort of 
if the losses are a certain amount of losses, well, the private sector takes the loss. And then once the loss gets really big, well, then the government guarantee kicks in. And that's kind of the, the nature of this, is that the government guarantee will be secondary behind, um, behind the private sector. You can sometimes see it as the same as uh, the analogy with bank capital, right? So the way that banks, banks work is where we all have our deposits in a bank. If the bank makes bad loans, well, the shareholders of the bank take the loss first. But if the losses are so big, the shareholders get wiped out, well, then the FDIC comes in and, and makes sure that our deposits are good. So this is sort of an analogy. Uh, Up to that. a certain point. Up to a certain point. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, okay, very good. Uh, design options. Okay, so, um, right, so, uh, so there's different ways of doing it. Right, you could say, well, let's just keep the government guarantee, the government sponsored enterprises, and just national. You can imagine just nationalizing the system. And let's just say, let's, let's. Uh, those of I have this kind of, you know, sort of quasi-private, um, sort of just say, well, let's just nationalize it, or let's have have some mix. Now I'm going to explain. I'm going to skip over this because I'll explain uh, more carefully. Okay, so here this is getting into um, the paper that uh, that Mark and I did with, uh, with two other co-authors. The paper looks a lot like. Um, the Corker Warner Bill. It's not exactly the same, but it's the same uh, broad structure. Okay, so um, here's a summary. Fannie and Freddie are, are privatized, and then other firms compete with them, right? So there's fully private. They essentially get to sold off. The government gets some revenue, gets paid back for the money it uh, put into them, and then other firms are allowed to purchase the guarantee. But to do that, then the government provides an explicit guarantee. So essentially, the government turns into an insurance company and says, "We will sell you." Firms, right? These these firms, secondary insurance, right? As long as you pay us the insurance premium and um, bring in private capital to take the losses first, and as long as the mortgages are the the right mortgages, you know, well, you know, sort of well underwritten, safe mortgages, we will provide this um, this secondary in, uh, insurance. Okay, so that's that's step number one. Number two is there's no no portfolios, right? So we get rid of the kind of um, uh, the, the, the benefits of these firms being able to uh, um, buy assets using low, you know, low cost funding. Um, the, the guarantee is explicit, right? So we, it's not, not implicit, but it's explicit and priced. And you know, uh, well, I'll, I'll get to the, the defects of this uh, in a second. And of course, there's gonna be, you know, I'm an economist, so I'm gonna have two hands, right? Every every good thing is gonna have a bad thing attached with it, and we're not, we're not, right? You can't get rid of the bad. The bad, you just try to to balance the good and the bad, right? Um, okay, and then the, the affordable housing is done explicitly by the government. Right? This is in my quick summary. I don't know what am I. What are the salient points I'm missing here? Um, uh, no, it's complete. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay. So, okay, so, I'll, I'll okay, so here's this is the simple version of the new system, and we will see the more complicated version in a second. And as, you, as we go from this slide to the next slide, you'll understand why it's a tough issue. Because right, this looks very clean, it's like oh, this is not, you know, not bad. Um, but the next one is, is uh, not quite right. So, um, right, so banks are still making the loans. Now you have Fannie, Freddie, and then A, B, and C. It could be, you know, A is a, a, a cooperative or a mutual of all the small, you know, small banks that get together and form a company. And the observation is that the, one of the credit cards in my pocket um, is uh, it says Visa on it, but it's actually issued by a, by a small credit union. But they actually don't do it. They don't do it themselves. There's another company that services credit unions, right? So, um, uh, and there's, you know, there's companies like this. If any of you are from Wisconsin, this CUNA is a big company that provides services to credit unions in, uh, in Mad from Madison. Um, so you can imagine a company forming to serve the 8,000 small banks in the United States. So maybe we'll call that security as A. B might be Wells Fargo. C could be JP Morgan. Uh, D could be Blackstone or you know some private equity fund says, hey, there's 20 billion in profits. We're actually really good at this financial stuff, so we're going to jump in and we think we'll get seven billion of these profits. Um, it could be that Fannie is sold off, or maybe Fannie um, uh, gets sold off and becomes its own, you know, its own uh, company. And maybe it, maybe Freddie Mac is bought by Capital One. Right? I'm just again, I'm making these names up, and um, and Capital One says, well, look. We can compete with, uh, with A, B, and C. Okay, so individual mortgages. These guys securitize them together, put the guarantee on, insure, insure the mortgage backed securities, sell them to investors. They pay an insurance premium to the government, and they get back an explicit guarantee. Now, here's a key difference, though, is that this guarantee has switched. Right, so it's no longer that the government is guaranteeing Fannie and Freddie. The government is guaranteeing the mortgage backed securities. Right, so imagine if there's another housing bust. 
and Fanny takes huge losses and Fanny goes out of business, well, in this system, Fanny goes out of business, right? They're done, right? And there's five or six other of them. So if Fanny goes down, well, the government doesn't have to step in and say, well, we have no choice but to save Fanny because otherwise no one will get a mortgage because then we'll say, well, well, you know, goodbye, Fanny. You know, homeowners, well, now you're going to get your mortgages, you know, still from the banks, but the banks will deal with, you know, A, B, C, and D rather than Fanny. All right, so as soon as it gets rid of the, the too big to fail issue by having the, the guarantee on the securities rather than on the entities. Okay. So here, so we have compute competition, the explicit guarantee, the guarantee is switched to the MBS, the government's being paid, and there's no, um, right, there's no, you've, there's none of the associated portfolios um, from the other, uh, the other slide. Okay, now, uh, good, so this is just the, uh, the summary. Are you going backwards? I'm going backwards, I'm sorry. Uh, Ah, uh, good, okay. So here's, so this is a little more complicated, right? So th this is exactly the same thing. So, um, so these are... Uh, it, it took me like three days to put yeah. together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Can I, and before you get into this yeah, please. complexity, I'm gonna stop you for one second. It's very clear that we are gonna run out of time if we stick with our original plan, which was to finish at 11.30. Um, Lorraine, are you able to stay another half hour till noon? Yeah, I can well, no, no, well, yeah, so, I'm gonna, We're going to finish at 11.30, don't yeah. worry. Well, yeah. but Lorraine hasn't had a chance to present. She's got slides and a presentation. Okay, okay. I'm going to finish so, in like four <laughs> minutes. I'm going to finish in like I'll, four minutes. I'm I'll, I'll just say we can okay. stay longer, and for those who want to stay, we'll, we'll be here. So we're, okay. not, um, we're not too constrained. That's all. Okay. Okay. So thanks. We'll okay. So um, all right, I'm going to, I'm, I'm just about done here. Okay, so here it says, again, it's the same thing where the, Homeowner is getting a mortgage, the, the servicing, which I haven't talked about. There's um, uh, now there's uh, people make the mortgage backed securities, they go into this common securitization platform. So you have all these different mortgage backed securities, and one, you know, one, one sort of a, a thorny issue is Fannie and Fannie now dominate this industry. It's actually Fannie dominates. So Fannie is really outdistancing Freddie in this uh, in housing finance. And if you are, even if you're a gigantic firm, say you're Bank of America, you say, we can't enter and compete with Fannie because Fannie's securities dominate, and there's a liquidity effect, right? If, you know, imagine if you want to buy you know, mortgage-backed security mm -hmm. from Fannie, well, there's a huge market, right? You want to buy it today, sell it tomorrow, there's you know, tons of them, really liquid market, whereas if B of A comes in and puts out three of them, well, it's gonna be a pretty liquid market, right? It's kind of hard to buy and sell something that's just getting started. So this common securitization platform will take the market and put it all together and say, Everyone, Fannie, Freddie, the new entrants, they all have to, their, their mortgage-backed securities all compete in the same pool, and they're all the same. So there's a certain homogenization of the market, which allows other firms to come in and, uh, and, and compete. We still have some of the, the advantages of the, the current system, which we're not going to go into with the, uh, the TBA market. We'll talk about that uh, separately. And then the government, the, the so-called FMIC, the Federal Mortgage Insurance Corporation, becomes the government reinsurer, right? So here's the explicit guarantee, and then it funds the different uh, affordable housing funds, and then sells, right, the, the credit, there's no credit risk, as Mark said, so the, the mortgage-backed securities are being sold to, uh, to rate investors. And so this is the more complicated version, of course, the, the highlighting is key, to say, well, what's the government and what's private? So this is, uh, this is just, just uh, filling it out, and um, and just to re reiterate, one thing that we, we thought was really important is to say explicitly what's the government doing and what's the private sector doing. Is that common yeah. securitization platform about as complicated as healthcare.gov? So is that, that is, to me, that's the, that is the key issue, is that Fannie Freddie is saying this up. So my metaphor, it's a great question, my metaphor is that this is like, um, it's like transplanting a hand, right? Your hand gets chopped off and then putting it back together. We, we all know it's possible there's, there's a lot of connections. And so Fannie and Freddie really sit in the middle of the financial system, the housing finance system, right, with pipes, you know, sort of the internet tubes, to, um, to originators and then to end-use investors, right? And all those connections have to be re recreated, right? So, and that's critically important. And those huh. connections are all patented. Okay, well, that, <laughs> that, 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 that I'm not so worried about because this is the government, right, the government owns these firms and can tell them, look, in fact, the, the way the, 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 um, the government has, has directed the firms to work together and they've set up a, 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 a jointly owned company out in Bethesda to do this job. It is a huge job. And, and 
and getting that thing to work right is key to reform. So actually, it'd be fascinating. I don't know if they would let journalists on site. It'd be fascinating to go up there. It'd be kind of the equivalent of going to, you know, the sort of the ACA, the guys programming the ACA and watching them. It'd be a, it'd be a great thing. Uh, okay, so private capital come in. Um, I'm not going to go through. Uh, I'm not going to go through private capital. I think that's said enough. Um, the, again, FMIC, and you have the slide, but the FMIC is the federal insurer. Um, uh, pattern after the FDIC that does this for banks, and I made the analogy uh, with banks. Maybe a mar market access fund, again, to subsidize uh, affordable housing activities. And I think this politically will be a key issue in the sense of, right, um, uh, the Republicans will look at this as spending, and Democrats will look at this and say, no, this is really important. Right? This is, uh, we're not going to do reform that helps kind of the middle class and above unless we do something that helps, you know, helps uh, people with moderate income. Um, now, criticism, this is what I want to, to get to, is that right, it maintains the government role. And some people say, well, the government shouldn't be involved in this. The government is selling insurance. It's hard to price the government insurance. I say before the government insurance was given away for free. So yeah, it's going to be hard to price insurance. There are ways to do it, but any price is going to be better than zero, right? which is what it was before. On the other side, people say, well, look, this is anti-housing. And this is essentially anyone who, in the old system, you know, sort of 2005 or 2004, Anyone who wanted to reform Fannie and Freddie, they would accuse that person of being anti-housing, right? Swagel wants to do away with Fannie and Freddie. He's anti-housing. Well, it kind of made sense, right? Because Fannie and Freddie lowered mortgage interest rates. Now, they put huge risks on the taxpayer, but some of that went transmitted through to lower interest rates. So saying that private sector has to take risk, well, that eventually will translate into higher interest rates. So that's kind of anti-housing. It's kind of a reflection of the fact that taxpayers were taking an uncompensated risk. But that's, anyway, that's, that's the thing. And of course, as, as um, the question talked about well, the mortgage interest deduction, was the other subsidies for housing get dialed back at the same time, you can imagine different headwinds for, for housing. And that's a, that, that will definitely be a challenge. Um, you can say, well, look, this is yet another thing the government's doing now, and we're going to let banks get into it. And so you can imagine people making, uh, you, I mean, you, obviously you can all name the senators who will make that argument. It's not um, lets, it asks them to. Yeah, well, allows, uh, allows. Well, yeah. it's no, it asks them to. I mean, if you want private sector participation or not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, uh, of course, if you were a bank and you said, and there's a government guarantee on offer, well, of course, what you want to do, your incentives, naturally, to take your worst loan and say, give me a government guarantee on this, right? That's just the incentive. So it puts a lot of stress on the regulator to make sure that the underwriting standards remain high, the capital is really there. So, so there's so uh, there's lots of criticisms, and again, I don't there's no you know in my, my view there's no perfect system. So you're just trying to balance the goals against the you know the, the downsides. I think Mark and I basically came up with perfect systems. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, now here my it so will be the system, by the way. You should, you should, it will be. It will. Yeah. Be, yeah this I agree. will be the system. This will be, yeah. If they build these eventually. No, they will, and this will be the system. This will be the system. Uh, so it'll it, be ten years from now, but it'll be. It'll be okay. <laughs> so and this is this is actually from a, a paper Mark did, um, where uh, um, uh, he calculated the cost of, of of reform, and this goes through and says, well, there's more private capital, and the government charges for its insurance. Well, he's looked at different um, uh, different proposals. So one is the one from the House that's you know virtually a private system, has the FHA, but otherwise has private capital instead of Fannie and Freddie. And it says, what's the impact of mortgage interest rates with nearly a percent and a half, right? So he says, well, Corker, the Corker-Warner bill in the Senate requires 10% capital, which is quite a lot of capital, actually. Um, you know, by comparison, Fannie and Freddie had 0.4%, right? So this is 25% uh, uh, 25 times uh, the capital, and um, that would be, what, 80-something? Like almost 100. Basically. Almost 100 basis points. Yes. Um, if you uh, instead nationalize the system and, and sold off 5% of the credit risk uh, you know, through various mechanisms to investors, that would have a, a smaller uh, increment. And you, sometimes you can see the difference is, uh, there's, there's, there's more than one difference, but a main, an important difference is the cost of the extra capital, um, the current system with the, what the government charges, and then before the, uh, you know, before the crisis. And of course you can see, well, of course the lower, the lower impact of the system was that the government was taking on risk without being compensated. And then the question is, well, how much safety do you want? 
And so this is the trade-off, right? Each, as you go up further, taxpayers are further protected, but of course there's an impact on the housing system. And that's, that's the basic that's point that we think, the cost and in, in interest rate? This is the ultimate, this is the, co this is the impact on the end user, on the, on the homeowner. On the mortgage. On the mortgage, uh-huh. So this is, this is, what Mark's done is he's translated from the capital markets down to the level of the individual uh, homeowner. Yeah. Is there space in the new system for completely unregulated, what might have once been called subprime? Yep, there absolutely is. And so that's, that's one of the concerns. And I've, I've heard, actually, I testified at Senate Banking, and this is something that Senator Warren from Massachusetts raised. And so she says, I don't want to go back to the Wild West. And so it's, it's an interesting issue because on, one, on the one hand, I would say a policy victory is to have some mortgages not guaranteed by the government. Right? So some people voluntarily choose not to go to the government, but then you can imagine going too far and going back to the kind of pre-crisis, lousy mortgages. Now Dodd-Frank, of course, has other provisions, has the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, it has the risk retention that you know, Mark mentioned that isn't all the way in there. So you could say, well, look, there's a whole portfolio of things that were meant to fix housing, but ultimately that's the question. Um, and so there's one way to solve, to solve this is to say, let's just nationalize this, right? All mortgages must have a government guarantee, and so you're not allowed to make, the only mortgages you can make are government, the government approved ones, but then you've taken out innovation. So you've increased safety, you've taken out innovation. So it's a, yeah, you know, we're all about trade-offs, and so that's the, uh, that's the Okay, transition, um, uh, again, I, I think I kind of, um, I, I, my chart with the three or four bubbles, that was meant to be uh, talking about uh, transition, but again, I'll just, I'll just summarize really quickly. What's fascinating to me is that the steps forward are the same, right? So let's say we're gonna go to the Scott Garrett bill. You would not go from here to the end point right away. You'd start by raising the guarantee fee. You'd reduce the amount that the government's willing to insure. You'd have more private capital. You'd kind of say, well, the government's not going to insure Englewood, only Tenafly, you know, whatever. A and then eventually you'd end up at a fully private system. <coughs> but to get there, you have to first transit through, you know, a narrower government guarantee. So that's to me what's fascinating, is that the, the debate to me boils down to, well, how far do we go? Now, as, as Mark's slide, you know, Mark's calculation shows, well, as you go more and protect taxpayers more, there's an impact on interest rates. So there's a sense in which one, one, one thing that you can imagine happening is we start the journey of reform, interest rates start going up, and at some point housing becomes too expensive and credit is too narrow, and as a society we say, okay, good, that's it, we're done. You know, we found the right balancing act, and that's what our political system uh, does. So I, to me, that's, it's a question of how will this debate evolve? Will we start the transition, start the, the change, before we know the ultimate outcome? Or will we first decide on the, the end state and then begin the, the transition? And it's like we're in said, the regulator, Ed DeMarco, has started it, but on a small scale. So yeah, again, just uh, more, more details. Um, and then here's a, a timeline in the plan that um, Mark and I and, uh, and others um, uh, worked on. Um, and this is a, these are questions, so I won't, won't answer them. What's gonna drive it forward, right? What, what are the incentives? The government now has a $20 billion annuity it's fascinating that members of Congress haven't yet spent this, right? But once they do, it'll be hard to reform the system because then they'll be part of the, uh, the government. And then why, you know, sort of what, what, so what's gonna, what's going to um, make reform happen? Uh, 